Do I look at this thing? You can look wherever you'd like. <laughs> well, welcome everybody. I know a lot of you, but um, good to see you all again. Um, I'm Celeste Fraser. This is the Dexas Valley Watershed Coalition, also called the Wandering Wildlife Society. And we are changing that name. So look for it. Well, because people weren't making a connection between Wandering Wildlife and the Estes Valley Watershed Coalition. So now we're the EV Watershed Society. So look for Watershed Society uh, and you'll find us. Uh, as you know, we are doing all kinds of work in the field. Um, Dylan Formiller, who is our project coordinator, is doing a lot organizing uh, our contractors to do work in fire mitigation in forests. Uh, we do water cleanup in the spring and summer, plant new uh, natives. So we're doing an awful lot and we're the ones who um, helped the environment after the 2013 flood. So thanks for coming. And tonight we have Dr. Chris Ray, who is from CU. And she has done, you have studied pikas for a while, right? Yes, I have studied pikas for um, 36 years. Oh, geez, okay. Well, I'll let you take it away. Thanks for coming. Okay, it's always really fun to get introduced as a doctor and then talk about pikas. It gives you this wonderful imposter syndrome or something. <laughs> Everybody, I'm Dr. Grace. <laughs> yeah, so not that kind of doctor. Um, studying pikes for, for 36 years, and, and along the way, um, you notice a lot of interesting things about, about an animal and everything that it can teach you about the world. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today is just some of the things we can learn from pikes. And I'll start out with um, sort of a general natural history. Um, showing you some things that you may or may not have been able to see up close about pikas, and then and then um, move on to some uh, uh, our latest scientific story, which is really about water, which I hope you guys will appreciate, and then um, and then move on to a little bit more science about pikas, and then we're going to go to Mongolia. So that's the the arc of the talk. And um, I see a couple familiar faces, so luckily I, you you'll be happy to know I have new things to say. <laughs> oh, there will be some old things. That's why we're here. Uh, we want to yeah. hear those new things. Yeah, yeah. I think I have one of your pictures in here too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so one of the cool things about pikas is that they, um, they, they're hoarders. They have to, they have to gather their food for the winter, and this drives a huge amount of their uh, ecology and and why they're important to us in terms of being a, a watershed indicator for us. So this, this is a little pika. Um, taking one of many mouthfuls of food that's going to pile into a pile that'll be, oh, we can make a pile that, that might be big enough to fit Graham underneath that piano there for the winter, depending on where they live, they might have to have that much uh, vegetation to survive oh, the, the winter. Because they don't hibernate, they got to eat all winter long and just keep, keep warm. The way they keep warm is, is having a high metabolic rate and they got to feed that with calories, so they got to, they got to forage. So normally I would advance my slide in the way that I just tried to, and nothing happened. Oh, there we go. I'll do a different button. <laughs> no sideways buttons, only up and down. So this is actually a juvenile pika, and, and a, lucky, a lucky little juvenile that's already uh, found a place that's appropriate for making a hay pie. Just think about what, what happens with a little animal like this. I guess um, they're born in the, in the mountain springtime, so you know maybe about <laughs> June or something. And, and they have to get to full-grown size and go find a territory because they're individually territorial. They can't just shack up with somebody. So they got to go find a territory, amass a hay pile, and be ready for the winter. This is a lot to do in one really short alpine summer. So this is a, a lucky animal that's found a spot, probably a spot where if I could die last summer, um, and, and it's already starting to make a nice hay. How can I tell it's a juvenile? Um, males and females are really hard to tell apart unless you hear the male do the song, which is a different thing, and hopefully we'll get to hear a song at the end here. 
Um, so you can't really tell by looking at them. Uh, but juveniles and adults, you can tell the difference because juveniles are cuter. <laughs> Very scientific. Really, they have you know a bigger head to body ratio, and you know they look like hey, this is an adult bringing something good to his hay pile. This is a, a male, and and this this is an interesting part about pikes. I said they're individually territorial, and and a pike needs about as much room as there is in, in this room right here. The maximum number of pikes that could cram in here would be two. Oh, jeez. And, and they're climate sensitive too. Um, so this actually explains why you wouldn't see them in zoos. I mean, they have penguins in zoos, right? They have refrigerated rooms, but a penguin exhibit, you can have 28 penguins or something doing their cute things and you'd have one pika or maybe two pika. So it wouldn't work out very well. But, but um, they're individually territorial and, and these spots where hay piles need to be built, they don't change over the generations. This rock here has been hosting a pika that I call the colonist ever since my first study at this study site. I've gone to this study site every year for 38 years. There's, I think it's right in there somewhere. It's getting so long I can't even have. But every single year I go there and I go up to where the colonist is, way up the mountain, and, and there's always a pika hanging under this rock, and it's always a male. So there are certain territories that are good for males and certain that are better for females. Obviously, they have different biological functions. The female has to have a place that works for her to um, commute from there to wherever she's going to have her babies. She doesn't dare have her babies right here in a hay pile because I guess they're individually territorial. I think I've said that about eight times already. They, when they pop out, they are ready to fight for territory. So if, if, if she has three pikes pop out right here in her hay pile, they're going to be trying to fight her for the hay pile. That's no good. Also, the predators, the weasels are coming right here to this hay pile, and they're looking for her every day. And she can avoid them, but the babies may not be able to. So she has the babies off somewhere else. And we'll talk in a, in a bit about where she might do that. Where would be a good spot? You guys can think ahead. Where would be a good spot for Pike and have its babies? It's a, it's a fun puzzle. This is a really beautiful hay pile, so I'd like to show it. Um, Lots of times they're they're pretty like this as they as they gather the flowers and flowers start to senesce and fall. Weird things can show up in hay piles. Um, this one has mushrooms all in it and, and some dead little little conifer twigs here that I guess will eat anything. So they eat. Um, yeah, let's just prove it. Look at this pipe. So. If you think it happened mushroom by accident, think again. It's munching away on this little mushroom. And we, we don't see that very often, but this just shows that they're generally flexible. And um, one thing we do know is that they eat a lot of vegetation that we would consider toxic. So um, full of things like cardiac glycosides and nasty stuff that humans don't want to eat. And, and a lot of other animals don't eat much of it either. But pikes can eat it because of this hoarding thing that they do. They clip the vegetation, they store it, and as soon as they clip it, the toxins start breaking down. Those are protective chemicals that the plant uses to keep things from eating it. That's the whole reason why like, plants are such great sources of drugs for us, because they have all kinds of nasty things in there. The plants try to say, don't eat my seeds. And, and, <laughs> and the pikes get around that by, by going ahead and just collecting the, the plants and, and storing them. And then later in the winter, those plants that have all those toxins in them those are breaking down and releasing nitrogen. That's really what the pica wants. It wants all those nutrients to come available to the pica without making the tummy ache later in, in the season. So a pica has two different diets, a summer diet that they eat right off the stalk, and then the winter diet that they, that they store and make the most of what's available. And they're quite picky, actually, about what they choose. And, and different pikas choose different things. It's kind of funny. This picture was taken at a, a safe site up on Niwot Ridge where someone proved that pikas prefer to collect this stuff here, but this is mainly all um, dead alpine havens. So it's a, a yellow flowering plant in the rose family. And, and yeah, pikas really like to eat that up there. However, this pika has collected only grass in the hay pile, even though it's surrounded by growing forbs of flowers that, that they're supposed to prefer. 
I haven't been able to figure this out yet. Why are they so different? Here's the alpine havens when it's still nice and fresh and green. Um, pike is collected, put it in a hay pile, and they're not supposed to eat it when it's like this because this is when it's supposed to make a tummy ache. And, and, and people have tested, and sure enough, it does make a tummy ache for pikas. But I see them eating it. Sometimes they eat it, you know, just the way it is. All kinds of weird things they do. Um, another thing that's really good for uh, collecting hay is a big rock. So when you're looking for pikas out there in, in the wild, um, you might, here's, here's a, a big rock that's right by uh, one of the more famous trails in the Rocky Mountain National Park. People build a cairn on top. I just love it because it's a big rock, and so they make their hay pile underneath. And this is a big rock in Montana at that long-term study site um, where we go going every year. And this, this is a big rock. This one didn't used to be there when I when I first started, but it came rolling down the mountain, you know, maybe five years ago, and it landed in just the right spot. And because it's a giant rock, I just immediately started using it. And um, so now it's a new hay pile rock. But in general, around that canyon, I've got about um, around 300 different pike hay pile sites around the canyon, and they are amazingly stable. So for over 30 years, almost all of them are exactly the same as when I first got there, and most of them were probably there for a millennia before that. I thought when I first got there that all these cliffs, it's a box canyon with these cliffs all around it, I thought for sure rocks are tumbling down there and, and on these steep tails slope so much that the next year I'd come back and there would have been lots of rock slides and everything would be different. Not at all. There was one rock slide one time, but it didn't wipe out the biggest rocks. It kind of covered a whole slope, and the biggest rocks were still there, and the bikes were still using them. So it's really interesting how things can go over time. Another cool thing about pikes is because they make these hay piles, you can see what's been going on with them. Because you can just go around looking for hay piles and see what state they're in. This is one where the year before I saw it, it was this is kind of hay pile. I mean, it really looked like a hay pile. It was a stack. Like a haystack. Coming out, the rocks were down low and the haystack was nice and big. Every year, the pika who is at this spot tries to make a haystack like that. It doesn't put it under the rocks. It's the spot, not the pika, that makes them do this. And I don't understand it. There's lots of things, lots of things the pikas make a different kind of hay pile in different places. And the pikas turn over, but the behavior doesn't. So strange. But this one here, we can see when we come through the next year. This pike died before it used all its hay. And then another little one came and started to make a new hay pile in the summertime. And then it died because you can see it's only dead stuff here, but it's not quite as dead as that. If it had continued to live, this dead stuff that's laying here would have more green stuff stacked on top of it. And because once they start haying, they just keep haying as long as they live. <laughs> and so I can see these layers of, of mortality, <laughs> which is kind of fun. Nice to be able to infer what's happening when you can't talk to the animals. Um, so here's Rocky Mountain National Park, and uh, you may or may not be aware that there are actually two subspecies of pika in, in this one park, which is really cool. The, the, the red uh, little pins are, are um, Okatona princeps princeps, which is the one that also occurs up in Montana, where I've been studying them for a long time. And then there's Okatona princeps saxatilis, which is our southern pika, which is down here in the blue. And we're going to listen to the two different calls if we, if we possibly can here. We're going to see what happens. So here's, here's the northern. Sound a little pissed off, right? I mean, that's, that's how they are. <laughs> and that's the male. I uh, no, no. No? OK. No, the, the male has a song. And both the male and female have a call. And the call sounds kind of like that, and you can't tell who's making it. And the male has a song though that's very different. Hopefully we'll hear that later. Oh my, that's quite loud. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not sure whether I am uh, controlling that or not. Oh yeah, I am. Okay. Um, yeah, so so a little bit different calls. For north and south, and a um, little different genetics. Uh, we've done genetic studies and, and shown that there is uh, a real distinction between these two. However, they are interbreeding a little bit on this on this edge, and so we're really looking forward to tracking that over time. Because of course, as climate changes, they may 
mix more or less uh, than they do now. So can you tell the difference visually? I can't, and unfortunately, we might be an endless, endless loop of listening to this one too, because I was trying to advance the slides, and you know, I wasn't trying to do that. Um, uh, no, you can't tell the difference, and in fact, um, we're going to go to Mongolia, and you might not be able to see the difference. You mentioned that the princeps subspecies is also found in Montana. Is the Saxatilla species found anywhere besides Colorado, or is it unique to this area? I uh, know it goes from Colorado south, so it goes down into New, Me New Mexico. So we just happen to sit right on the line between yeah. them? Okay. Yeah, and that line, can anybody guess what that line is? Charlie's Road. <laughs> well, the road itself probably isn't the problem. They can run right across that. Right. Yeah, but but it is, I mean, that's right about where it is. Right. But the real reason probably that they have any dividing line at all is the Colorado River. So uh, the headwaters of Colorado, the princeps is north of it, and uh, Saxatilla is south in, in general. There's some, some, something going on. But they get to mix a lot more over here on the right-hand side. OK, I'm going to try that again and see if I can make it. Hit it twice. Okay, um, what else is going on in the park here? Um, let's see. Uh, so uh, we did a study uh, two year, two summers ago uh, where we went out to a lot of trails in the park and looked for, um, just did these occupancy surveys for pikas along an elevational gradient throughout the pike park. We were really interested to see whether or not pikas were disappearing from lower elevations in the park like in some other places in the range. So it turned out that it differed by the subspecies in the park. So if we look at the northern subspecies, this, this graph is supposed to show um, going from 9,000 to 12,000 feet, the difference between occupied and unoccupied. Um, where it's wider, there are more signs of pica. So where we see occupied sites is at just a little bit above 10,000 feet, and here, a little bit above 10,000 feet. These are much more similar. In this one here, in the southern species, southern subspecies, it's not a species, um, we have more differentiation. So we have um, the occupied sites are at higher elevation, above 11,000 feet in general, whereas the unoccupied sites are more above, above 10,000 feet. So we're, we're starting to lose some of the southern subspecies from the lower elevations in the park. So are those sites that were previously occupied? Yeah, so you can see um, you can see whether or not there was evidence of former pica presence there by looking, of course, for old hay pile stuff, which can last for decades. You can see um, also old scat. So pikas make a scat that's like a peppercorn, looks almost exactly like a peppercorn. It's that size, it's that shape, and nothing else makes a scat like that little spherical thing. Um, even baby rabbits make poops bigger than that. So um, you know pikas have been there if you find pike poop. And so that's another great reason we study them, and another reason that we do these occupancy surveys where we can just tell whether or not pikas have been there. Uh, it does get a little bit hard eventually, though, to uh, figure out whether or not that poop is fresh. Maybe you find a poop, and it's from 20 years ago. You know, you got to be able to decide, well, our pike is still here. So then you start looking for a sign that, that you can tell the difference. Do you have a question? Question online. Yeah. Um, is one of the different subspecies more common across the rest of the nation, or is it pretty 50 50? Um, there are um, about five subspecies of pike. They only occur in the western U.S., and the area over which each of those subspecies occurs, um, it does vary, but there's not one where it's you know only found on one side of a mountain and the rest of them are a whole state. Um, they're kind of roughly. We used to think there were 36 subspecies of pika. That's before we could look at the genetics. When we were just looking at you know the color of the fur and stuff that people can imagine differs between individuals. So, so now we start going into the, the first story, and, it, and I said it's going to be a little bit about water. So pikas, you may have noticed, you only find them in taluses, uh, broken rock habitats. Um, you can maybe find one 
at the edge of a forest under a tree or in the meadow, but it's going to be pretty close to rocks. They're not going to be found away from rocks. Um, that's the North American pika. There are pikas in Asia that, that use other habitats, but there are also tailless dwelling pikas in Asia. About half the species of pika in the world are tailless dwelling, and the other half are step dwelling, and they're almost just like prairie dogs, except that they're lagomorphs, not rodents. So if, everybody, if anybody calls a pika a rodent, you know, you, know, you know better now. They're not rodents, they're related to rabbits, and um, they have a very different ecology. So, so they, these guys are only found in palaces, and um, palaces are, are, are a really cool thing that tends to be formed and maintained where there's freeze-thaw process. Uh, we don't see taluses everywhere. We tend to see them in the mountains, and that's because it has the right climate to make the talus and maintain the talus. Otherwise, plants come in and start growing on the talus and cover it up, and we don't have talus anymore. So, so that's why we, we tend to see these rocks, these rocky habitats in the mountains. Where talus occurs down at sea level or way down low in the deserts or down in New Mexico where there are um, um, old lava beds and there's rock that's a whole lot like talus, Pikas will occur. They don't need to be in the mountains. They need to be in tails. So lava beds, boulder fields, anything like that, if it's there, pikas can, can use it. Um, ore dumps from our mining operations, pikas mm -hmm. will colonize it and, and use it. They need this kind of rock. The rock is an amazing thing. This structure of rock that's all kind of big and jumbled and fractured, it's like a million chimneys all next to each other. It's a funny place where cool air can pool in the cracks and warm air can rise up through the cracks and you get basically like a heat pump. Hmm. And it's cold down underneath those rocks. I mean, if you ever walk, walk by a talus, it's kind of by a trail or something, you can feel cold air, drain, cold air drainage coming out from underneath it sometimes. If you stick your hand down in talus when you're in there, you'll notice that it's 20 degrees cooler in just two feet. This is, this is quite amazing. So the pikas are using that habitat in order to stay cool. They have this really high metabolic rate to stay warm all winter because that's what they have to do. And in the summertime, they've got to stay cool. They can't just switch off the metabolism. So there they are next to their refrigerator. And they come up every once in a while, do their thing, and go back down and get cool. And that's how they survive. They have no way of, of shedding heat. They can't sweat, they don't pant, they don't have bare spots anywhere where they can, you know, try a little, a little heat escape in the wind or anything. They've got no way to shed heat. They must be next to this refrigerator or they will die. So if you have a pica and you're holding it and it's 75 degrees out, nice and balmy for a human, it's likely to be dead in two or three hours. It needs to get cool. They can come up and you can find them at Lava Beds National Monument where it's 170 degrees Fahrenheit on the ground, like a hot parking lot in the sun, and there'll be a pika sitting there and you'll think I'm crazy because, you know, obviously this animal can handle the heat. But there's ice underneath the lava beds. Those old lava tubes that, that were formed as the lava bed was cooling, the lava drains out of them, water eventually goes in and freezes. It, it's perfect, perfect environment for maintaining subsurface ice. And so it's a perfect environment for maintaining pikas because it's nice and cool underneath there. It's not that pikas need the ice, they just need the, the microclimate that can maintain the ice. They need it cold. So as the, as the atmosphere warms, our cryosphere is disappearing. So our snow, all of our frozen water is disappearing. And mostly we notice that in terms of you know glaciers getting smaller and things like that. But these rock piles that are tailless that don't look like much, they're some of the last best places for frozen permafrost, uh, any kind of seasonal ice or whatever to be underneath the surface. We can't get out of it, nobody can get out of it except the pygas, and, and they're using that. So so that's I mean I, I posed it as a question: does tailless slow the process of disappearing ice? Um, it's pretty much well known that it probably does, um, but we don't know how fast. So I'm interested in studying that, you know, along with squeezing pikas. And uh, so here's a study that we did that uh, features 
a man who used to live among you here in Estes Park named Bob Creer. Um, Bob Creer was uh, in the 10th Mountain Division and he actually was uh, responsible for helping get the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge designated. He was an amazing person and I met him when he was about 90 years old. And I met him because I had read a dissertation that I found at the university, some musty old dissertation, and I started reading it and I was amazingly entertained. This guy had gone out and done this amazing study of pikas somewhere right on Nawa Ridge. I didn't know where because, of course, he didn't have GPS back <laughs> then. And, and uh, he had just learned so much. And partly because, being a 10th Mountain Division guy, he was out there all winter long. And he studied them all winter for a couple of winters. In fact, the winter I was born. And, and so here, he knew something before I was even born. It was amazing. And, <laughs> and I was really fascinated for so many reasons about his dissertation. But the most amazing thing I read in there was that he put temperature sensors underneath the talus and above the talus to characterize the microclimate because he had this idea that it was important to pikas. He was the first person to think of doing that. And by the time I was reading his dissertation, we all knew pikas were climate sensitive. But he didn't really know that that much. And he, he went out there and did the hard work. Back then, you had to have a biomechanical strip with a pen on it and a rotating tube with paper. And you had to wind it up once a week. And that's how you told your temperature. It was just this thing that would just keep going round and round while the pen went up and down with the temperature. And you had this great temperature record, but you had to get your bottom out there every week to get that, that data. And he did that all year round. And, and uh, so he's my hero. But I didn't know where a site was because he had a GPS. So why bummer? Well, here's the rest of that story. Here's the dissertation. Here's a map that was in the dissertation. Someone drew this map. And um, it's kind of hard to read and all because this is like the third copy of the dissertation or something. But but I you know I looked at it and kind of bored over it and wondered about it and I have no idea you know it says scale here but you can't read the numbers or anything so I didn't know much about this all I knew was the shape of the talus. But one day one day I came through the trees and that was the talus slope I was sure and and the way the way I thought I had figured out is uh, he built. A, um, he built a, a platform in the trees so he could look down on the pikes, and I found that platform, and then I knew for sure it was his. Oh. And then I knew, well, this is where he was supposed to have his, he had had his temperature station, right here. And I went over there, and the post was still there. So we just, we just saw one of his posts here. Back when he did this, when I was born, this was a sapling. He cut down, and then he notched it, and he put his equipment on there, and he measured the temperatures above. Way above the snow and down below uh, a meter and a half into the tail. <laughs> so pretty cool stuff. So I was then able to um, to find that stuff. And then I was at a dinner party one time, uh, just a couple months after that, I guess. And I met a man named Jim Benedict. And here he is here. Jim's gone now too. But um, he he started asking me what I was doing. And I told him about my kids. And he knew all kinds of stuff about my kids. And what they do and all this cool stuff. And I said, I found this dissertation by Bob Greer and it was great. And then I just found his study site and I couldn't believe it. And he's listening to me. He's a real soft spoken person. He didn't, doesn't talk a lot right at first. And uh, he listens to my whole story about me finding the patch coming out of the trees and finding the platform. And he said, I drew that map. <laughs> <laughs> and I thanked him because, you know, without that, I never would have known. So, so he said, you want to meet Bob? I was like, well, I couldn't believe it. I didn't think he would still be alive. But he said he lives in Estes. So we went and had lunch with Bob. And, and, and here's Joyce Gellhorn, who was a contemporary of Bob and Jim um, at, at the Mountain Research Station. Back when they were all college students, she actually had a crush on Bob. He told me years later. Um, <laughs> so I got to tell him that. He never married or anything, but he was able to hear about that. Um, so, so these guys, I actually. We managed to get Bob to come to his study site. He was 90 years old. He managed to get all the way to the study site and confirm, yes, this was my study site. <laughs> and, uh, and then I became friends with him and, and kept uh, in touch until he died a few years ago. Um, but what we've learned from his study site since then is really fascinating. So I am at the Institute for Arctic and Alpine Research 
um, at the University of Colorado. And um, we measure temperature all the time. And uh, here's a couple of our, our weather stations where we're measuring temperature from 1950 to, you know, year now. And we're noticing that in the alpine and in the subalpine, where it's warmer, temperatures have been going up over time. If we look at precipitation, namely snow here, right? Um, we don't see that kind of pattern. We see some sort of a step change in the alpine, but we, we don't see the, the trend that we're seeing in temperature. But we see these patterns, and, and um, I really want to know what's going on underneath. I mean, we always measure temperature at head height for humans, <laughs> but animals, they use the stuff underneath. They're under the snow in the winter. I want to know, you know, what is it like for them? So I've been putting temperature sensors out for a long time, and as soon as I found Creer's study site and where his weather station was, nice view, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good place. Um, this was where his weather station was. Um, and, and so I put my temperature sensors there, one uh, just below the surface, and um, have to be out of the sun um, for, for my kind of temperatures. So just below the surface and a meter and a half into the talus. And he had them there too, but then he had one above. And so for that one up above, I hide it in the tree because it has to be kind of in the shade. He was able to make a Stevenson screen and put his in there. But now that it's a, you know, now that it's a wilderness area, you can't have stuff visible to the public. So, so um, I, I hide my stuff. I have I have a permit to uh, hide some of it, but the one in the tree, I don't have a permit for. Don't say anything. <laughs> it's really important to have these data, though. So, so here I am putting my neck out on the line. Um, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, taluses, you have soil, and then you have jumble of rocks on there. And um, and then we have a, a sensor, a deep sensor, meter and a half into the talus. Have one right near the surface, so it's shaded by the rocks, but it's, it's um, in contact with the surface air. And then there's a free air sensor, which is way up high. And here's the kind of data that we get out of that, that kind of thing. Um, this is a monthly mean of daily temperatures. And so we're looking at the little dots are like monthly mean. So here's July, August, September, yeah, all the way through a year. This is the free air temperature. So one way above the temperature, the talus. And, and what you're looking at here are, Screer only took these temperatures for one year. It's one year a day, going from July through June of the whole year. Um, and his data are in black here. And there's only one dot for every month because he only had one month. Me, I started putting them out there in 2008, and I've been able to do it year after year after year. And so I have a distribution of dots at every month. And my goal as a scientist is to compare his dot with my distribution of dots to see whether they're different, right? So his dots lie way outside the distribution of dots that I have, and I know the temperatures have changed all the time. And for some months in the fall, we don't have any change. But in the spring, and in the summer, we have, we have some change. That's in the free air. And we all expected that temperatures would go up from when I was born to now um, in the free air. Not too exciting, but we also measured them underneath. And what's the prediction? Because, you know, as a scientist, you always have to call the corner pocket or whatever. You got to tell ahead of time <laughs> what you think is going to happen. Well, what I thought was going to happen is that underneath the rocks and the snow, temperatures wouldn't change as much as it would in the free air. We all know the free air is changing. It's well mixed. Underneath this cap of snow and rock, it should be less well mixed. And I figured it would change slower. So here's what really happened. It changed faster or more. So, faster. so here's, here's the uh, sensor data from the shallow talus right underneath the surface. And we see there's a huge, it used to be a lot cooler down underneath there than it is here. Bigger difference than here. And here's the really deep one, and, and, and there are times when it's even, even more of a change as you go deep. So, so this is uh, really surprising, and obviously was worth putting out there as a publication. Do I understand it? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, I, I don't. Um, this isn't really my, my specialty. Uh, in any case, I'm good at counting population numbers and doing that math. But, but in terms of understanding geomorphology 
and its effects on climate, marine climate, I'm a little sketchy. So I'm learning about that. If people have ideas about what's going on here, let me know. But something is changing dramatically. And this, these are big temperature differences. This is like a 10 degree difference almost. 10 degrees C. <laughs> that's a lot, that's a lot of degrees. So um, this is a, a, a potentially a problem because in the winter time, that's when um, during these cold months, oh, I also thought it was going to change more in summer than in the winter. That was the opposite as well. So I really failed here as a scientist in terms of my predictions, but at least I'm studying, I'm, I'm discovering cool things. So there's this big change, and what's happening is in the winter, we aren't having those really cold temperatures. Instead, we're having warmer temperatures, which means we're not really refreezing to the bone, the earth underneath the taluses anymore. Which means that in the summer it can be even warmer than it would have been if it had really frozen for a bunch of months in the winter. So there's that's what I think might impact pike is they might not do so well in the summertime, even though the winter is warmer and they should be doing better because of that. In the summertime, they might not have the cool spaces that they need because it didn't get refrozen enough in the winter. That's my hypothesis. Now we'll see how we'll see how wrong that is next year when I get another talk. Um, but here's, I don't know, I don't know what, I guess I was just zooming in there so you could see it better. Sometimes I give a talk like this and it's a giant room and people can't see in the back. So, so Pika is, um, is this little animal about the size of your fist and it generates a lot of heat through a um, high metabolic rate. Because, you know, anything that's smaller, it's got a larger surface to volume ratio and it loses heat faster because it's got more surface to volume. That's why things like elephants get big and stuff. They don't, they don't need to shed heat fast or whatever. They do it through their ears or something. And, uh, mastodon and things that need to be warm in the cold. They can get really big because then they just maintain heat. These little guys are too small to do it that way. So they get a nice big thick rabbit coat, rabbit fur coat, and um, they they have almost no thermal conductance, so you can't, you know, like introduce heat to them or get it out of them because they got this thick coat. And then, and then they have the hot little metabolism inside of it to stay warm. And these guys are saxicolas, means they live in the rocks. Can't be word for that. And and for these little kind of animals that are down under the surface, winters are colder where there's less snow cover. So you think about snow cover is a blanket, and the animals are underneath it. And underneath that blanket is always close to freezing, which for a pika is perfect. They are just designed to be totally comfortable right at freezing. But when it drops to 10 below, 10 below freezing, 20 below freezing, which it can above the surface on a bad day for us, right? It can be way below freezing. Um, if, if the pikas couldn't get out of that temperature, then they're also hosed. So I did some, some work and showed that pikas are disappearing from places where there's less snow when they're being exposed to those really low temperatures in the winter. Now, in the summertime, it looks very different. Pikes are doing this amazing energetic activity to collect, to collect the vegetation. They're running back and forth, and it's warmer. And if you accidentally, if you trap a pike and you don't get them out quick, um, and they're sitting there in 75 degree temperature for a couple hours, you can kill them. So they, they die when they're held to temperatures above 25 C or about 75. Um, they sheet, shed heat only passively, we're going to talk about that. And we know populations are disappearing where summers are warmer. It turns out colder winters with less snow, where there's less snow in the winter, it's also warmer in the summer. So these things are correlated, and it's really hard to figure out what's getting the pikas first or worst. This is a baby pika. See, it's the cutest of all. And the younger <laughs> they are, the cuter they are. And, uh, <clears throat> Yeah, this was also taken by a uh, man who used to formerly live only, um, who learned a lot through his lens with the pikas here in the park. Um, this is data from Nyhawk Ridge, where somebody was trapping pikas back in the late 80s and, and, and early 90s. And um, then I came along in the 2000s, around, I started around 2008, really working there a lot. And, um, what I do is I go out and I trap pikas the same way they did. I use the same kind of traps and you know the methods are real similar. But the thing is, I don't have a whole 
classroom of memology students helping me, so I don't have the same trapping effort. They were, they were putting a lot more traps out in more days. I also have study sites in Montana and elsewhere, and so I'm only on that outreach for about a week, you know, every year. So I trap a lot less. However, I can look, to, look at the ratio of adults to juveniles that I trap because I'm using the same methods. Um, and so what we can look at is how does piker recruitment, the ratio of juveniles to adults, change with something like growing degree days. It actually looks the same as this if you if you if you look at it over time. But this one is just heat. And it turns out that you're gonna trap um, more juveniles per adult in colder temperatures um, than when it's warmer. And that's you know these are annual data in terms of the trapping rates. So we're seeing change here too. We have way less recruitment than we used to. These are from a couple of papers that were put out by Dave Hafner um, in 93 and 94. Um, and the one on the left shows the distribution of, of pipes in our region. And the one on the right shows the distribution of permafrost back at that time. And we see that they are really, really similar. Um, pipes are really dependent on the habitats that permafrost are dependent on. Um, so that's pretty cool. Like is live on ice, but we're wondering for how much longer, because this is changing. We're losing our ice, um, and so now we're just going to go into a few more things. What, what else can pikes tell us? So this is my little cartoon that links pikes to other everything else in the world. So we have we have climate, which we know is is changing. Climate has known effects on plants. We also are changing the global uh, atmospheric system. We're having more nitrogen deposition than we used to. When plants change, herbivores change, predators change, disease dynamics change, and all these things can potentially affect pikes. So there's plenty to study. The main three things that I'm going to talk about right now are climate niche, global change, and community dynamics. I'll give you three examples of things that we can learn about pikes, um, or things in ecology we can learn about by studying pikes. First, the climate niche. This is a fun, a fun little graph where we're looking here at the basal metabolic rate. So this is the metabolic, metabolic rate, the metabolism. And as it goes up, um, the body mass goes down. So start with really big things, like the elephant down here, and the horse, and the donkey. And by the time we get over here, we're looking at the white-footed mouse and the pygmy mouse. They have to have high metabolic rates in order to stay warm enough because they're shedding heat so fast. And these guys, they can have really low metabolic rates. The pica is way off the chart here. It's just amazing how neat and tidy all these data are, but the pica is, is one of these really interesting species that uh, has, a, has a different way to do it. And the only way they're doing that is through living with this ice under the tails. Where have pikas gone extinct? This is that work I was telling you about. We're looking here at the Great Basin of the US. Here's the Sierra, Sierra Nevada Mountains. Here are the Rocky Mountains. Everything in between is the Great Basin, and pikes used to be on all the mountain ranges out there. After the last glacial maximum, they were everywhere out there, and they've been slowly going extinct on mountain range after mountain range as the uh, as the temperatures have risen. Risen, and um, but they're still out there in some places. And we just did an analysis um, of of where are they disappearing, looking at things like uh, climate, etc. And it turns out. The thing that was supported most, this is the amount of support for a variable in terms of explaining extinction, um, it was cold days. They were disappearing where there's more cold days underneath the tails. We were measuring that with our little temperature sensors. Um, here's, here's the hot days. They're also disappearing you know, where there's more hot days. But this was the big one that really, really explained what was going on out there in the Great Basin. So pikas are freezing to death due to global warming. Here's uh, some niche modeling that we did for Rocky Mountain National Park. What we're seeing here, we don't get to see the, the pretty park boundary, but we're seeing the mountain ranges there. Colorado River runs through here, here's the Never Summer Range, and all of the color that we're seeing here are places where there's high to low probability of there being pikas. Where it's black, there's no probability of there being pikas. But where it's red, um, this is where they, they tend to live nowadays, um, 2011 to 2040. This is what we predict in terms of occupancy of the landscape by pikas. So pikas are 
doing great in this, in this corridor high in the mountains. But as we look at how the climate is projected to change in the park, we see um, reduced occupancy by pikas in our, in our predictions. And this was a pretty nice, uh, this wasn't the worst, uh, the worst situation in terms of carbon in the atmosphere. In the worst situation, we didn't see pikas at all in, in the park at the end of the uh, you know, by 2100, which is hard to believe. So this is one of the things we're studying is, you know, are, is them all right? So we go back to the fact that pikas need all this food. This is a, I just happen to know this is a female because I later trapped her. Um, she's got this nice big pay pile and uh, she needs that. It's hard to build it. She's got to put a lot of effort into that. She's got to gather all that food and take it back up. Somebody said it was like a, you going to the grocery store, putting a couple cabbages in your mouth and running home and doing that a thousand times. You have to get ready for the winter. It's the cabbages. Um, I guess uh, almost all of them are that cryptic color that we've been seeing. Um, but every once in a while, you find a melanistic pika. This, uh, this, this guy, we called him the Dark Lord. He lived for at least four, four years in Montana. And um, he, we put a, um, an automated camera outside his hay pile, and he had a little aspen growing there. And uh, he did some really energetic stuff in the, in the, winter, in the summertime. It's pretty amazing. I think if you had just this picture, you'd think it might be a bear cub if you didn't have the right scale. <laughs> He's pretty awesome. So, I mean, they just really do put out in the summertime when it's hot. This guy even lived at low elevation, so pretty cool. They also have to uh, defend their territories against interlopers. So um, here it looks to me like this is a, a younger pika probably coming in and was trying to get a territory and um, lost this fight. Got, got three box like rabbits and hares. And this is definitely one of those things where you'd have to go cool off after that. In their first few months, the juveniles have to disperse, establish a territory, and build a hay pile, as we talked about. Um, so if summer's too hot for dispersal and foraging and fighting and all that stuff, and if winter is too cold, then you have a possibility for this kind of thing to happen. Do we have any evidence that that's happening around here? Well, we can't actually um, study pikas really intensively in the park. Um, we do study them. We have a great citizen science project going on uh, <coughs> looking at at um, occupancy throughout the park, but on Nywat Ridge, we can really ham hammer this. Um, and this is a picture from an aerial an aerial view of Nywat Ridge. We're looking at a thing called the West Knoll. So there's a bump here, this bump on the ridge, and uh, where it's yellow, it's higher elevation than where it's blue. And if we actually look at all the old pika hay piles, we can we can date them just roughly by by looking at how old they are. Um, you know, how, how dead is the vegetation? Is there anything even left at all? And the blue ones are things that were only historically occupied. The red ones are kind of intermediate, and, and the yellow are currently occupied. And you can see that um, there appears in this in this picture to be a shrinkage of the Pikes Range um, up the slope to the top of the knoll. So that's a climate change sort of story. There's also global change. I want you guys to guess what's going on here. Maybe somebody else has already heard this, so let's fill the bees. But let's have somebody figure out what's going on here. I was sitting there, here's my water bottle. Like it comes up and it's licking it. Lick, 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 lick the water bottle. They have no idea there's water in there. I mean, there's no, yeah. Lick, 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 lick. This, this gal was helping take some data. She's, she's got her notebook here. She's supposed to be taking data on the pika's behavior, and instead the pika comes up and starts licking her butt and licks it for 15 oh. minutes. <laughs> the pika's licking her butt for 15 minutes. Why is it doing that? Salt. <laughs> Probably salt, yeah. So salt, salt. pikas could be salt limited. Um, in particular, we have this hypothesis that they might not just be salt limited, but they might be selenium salt limited. That is something that Cargill, you know, worries about, they, they have, uh, selenium salt um, products that they sell to all of the, um, I'm having a hard time with the words tonight. So people who have livestock, ranchers, I guess. Can't <laughs> <laughs> you, you dredge it up. Um, throughout the West, lots of ranchers put out selenium salt mix for their stock because 
we have granitic soils throughout the western US, a lot of granitic soils, and they tend to be low in selenium salts. Selenium is one of those things, we need a little bit of it, we don't need a lot, but we need a little bit for thermal regulation, immune function, all kinds of little things that we need it for. And if, if the stock are deficient, then they start being weak and, you know, taken by a mountain lion or whatever. So they, they, they boost the selenium salt that the stock have access to. Well, a pike it doesn't get to go anywhere. A pike is just stuck wherever it has a territory. It's stuck there the rest of its life. And if that's a selenium deficient soil, that's not so great. Um, so, you know, maybe they are uh, salt limited. Well, um, in particular, as you have this increasing nitrogen deposition, there are some chemical pathways through which selenium can be reduced in the system as nitrogen increases. And so I'm a little worried about whether anything like selenium deficiency might be increasing in these animals. And the reason that I, I, I think it might be happening is I bought a selenium salt lake, I put it out by a ficus hay pile, and I trained a camera on it, and that pike was licking that thing 24 seven. I had, I, I went to finally remove the thing because I thought I was going to kill the pike, um, but some other animal had come and taken it away. So I, I think that's going to be a fruitful avenue too. So what about community dynamics? Um, obviously, pikes are embedded in a in a nice, a sparse little alpine community that's kind of easy to study and awfully cute. Um, so here's the environment. I'm not really sure if this one's cute or not, but it's it's amazing anyway. Um, and and pikes and marmots are often just like this. Um, you will see that I think in a second here. Yeah, right. Oh, I know. Something happened. Oh, I think we're back to where we're supposed to be. Yeah, here we are. Um, so pikes and marmots, as I said, real close together. Here's one of my tag pikes, sort of communing with its marmot neighbor here. They, I don't ever see any real problem. This was uh, one of my postdocs, and he. He's pointing here with his hand to a marmot den and with his walking stick to a, a pika hay pile. Often, if there's a den around, pikas will set up shop right next to it or on top of it and uh, take advantage of it. Um, here, I have a camera trained on a, a marmot den. There's a hole there and there's a hole there. And the marmot's coming out in the morning, hungry marmot coming out in the morning. And, uh, then, then going back in with a little bit of grass in his mouth, it's running back into the hole. Uh, a little bit later in the morning, and and then later in the day, I have the same camera. Uh, this is that same hole there, and this is the other hole there. And Pike is looking in there, and then and then Pike just goes right on in, and then rear end is disappearing into the into the hole there. And I see this over and over and over again. Pike is go right into the marmot den. Marmots don't worry about Pike hay balls. They don't come to the Pike hay balls. They're stealing or the Pike hay balls back. I do have a student now who has a new study site, and, uh, and there's a marmot stealing from the pikes. But in general, in my 36 years, I've never seen it. So I don't think it's real important. But pikes certainly are getting some of our marmots, and that is not a cigar. <laughs> so the pikes, they gather the marmots get, and they put it in their hay box. And, and, and we don't know why. So we're starting to study that. So um, somebody already mentioned salt. And, could be that they're licking this because when I see them put scab in a hay pile, it stays there. It doesn't disappear like the hay does. It's still there the next season, um, just piling up in the hay pile. And so I don't know why they're putting it in there. And I think it might be a microbial thing, like some or maybe salts. But the other thing to talk about is that rabbits, hares, and pikas, they're all coprophages. They eat their own poop. So they eat a really low quality diet. They're just eating leaves and grass stem. They don't really eat the seeds of things or anything like that. The rodents do that. The rodents need seeds and insects and stuff like that to, to fuel their, their bodies. But pikas are eating really low quality stuff, like a horse would or something, right? But a horse or cow, they've got all these extra stomachs and things to get the maximum out of their food. And, and they, they, they eat it and then they barf it back up and chew it some more and eat it and, and, and they get the maximum out of that really weak food. But Pika has a simple digestive system like we do, just a simple gut, so they run their food through twice. So the first time it goes in, it comes out and it's like Vegemite. It is this kind of black tube of stuff that squeezes out like black toothpaste. And this Pika here is sitting there looking at me and taking pictures and then it just goes and real quick 
eats something coming out, and, and they all eat something coming out. They wouldn't know it, but they do. They eat their own poop. So the second time it comes out, it looks like that peppercorn, and they do not eat that because there's no nutrients left in it. And then there's so few nutrients, like hardly anything eats it, and it's persistent in the atmosphere, in the, in the, in the environment, and allows us to know where the pikas have been there. This is an old pika hay pile where they tend to collect marmot scat, and the marmot scat just, just stacks up. An example of how it just stacks up. So we still don't really understand why they're collecting it. I figure it's kind of like, well, maybe it's like K rations, you know, you just put it in there just in case. <laughs> I'm not eating it unless I have. Or, or maybe it's just lick the salt on the outside. Or maybe, I, I've noticed that, that when they have a hay pile and they have marmot scat, it's never clumped in one place. It's always seeded throughout the hay pile. And so I think maybe it's a microbial thing and there's microbes in the marmot scat that might eat molds and mildews to keep the hay nice. Anyway, we're going to Now we're going to Mongolia. I was on the edge of the Gobi Desert. As you can see, it's not exactly like our habitat here. Yeah, here's their ficus. Maybe it looks a little different than ours, but not much. So there they are, living there. Here's one. Here's another rock, you know, hanging out there. Just hanging out all day because when I was there, of course, it's summertime and it's hot. And I guess I don't like it hot. So they're just kind of hanging out, not doing anything. And um, in the wintertime, they've got to survive incredible freezing cold wind and temperature and the snow blows away and it's not good. I don't know how they make it. They're a little bigger than our pikas, which will help them maintain heat a little better. They are more well fur than our pikas. Like inside, their ears are super furry compared to ours, which is kind of smooth. And, um, so they're re retaining heat more in Mongolia, um, which makes sense. But still, hard to believe. I mean, they're living in this landscape. You see this little guy it's hanging out there in the shade. They all do. Every pike I saw was doing that and not moving around at all. Not like ours. Here's one just hiding totally under these, these funny pancake rocks, and sometimes there's a slit in between them, and he's just hanging in there. I put traps out and I was able to catch them at, at night. They don't, they don't go into the traps during the day, but I was able to catch them at night and one first thing in the morning. But they do amazing things there, these pikas. Um, in, in, in this part of Mongolia, you can find all these rock piles. And there's something that's neat for scale there. See how big the rocks are. I mean, that would work about this big. The pikas gather these rocks and make them in piles. Any idea why they do this? Trick question, of course. I don't really know the answer. But, but there's several reasons they do this. Um, and, and most of them have to do with the freezing cold winter. So, so you've got a hay pile and you're, you don't want it to blow away. So you put rocks on top of it. You've got a uh, freezing cold wind and the snow's not piling up anywhere because the because it's all going horizontal. And so you put a pile of rocks and it's a snow fence and snow piles up on the leeward side of that. And then you have some snow that you can be underneath and stay warm, right? Freezing is warm for pika. So um, that was really cool. Uh, you, line, you line a crack in the rock with, I mean, this is a big rock that has a crack in it. And then they fill it with the little rocks and then it catches the sand that come in, comes in the sandstorm. And then you have, you know, actual shelter instead of crack. Um, so they have all these different reasons why they have these, these rocks and they're, they're gathering up. The cool thing is, because they're doing all this gathering, you know where pikas have been in the landscape. You don't have to even find the poop. You just look at the rock piles. Nothing else moves these rocks around. They're all being collected by the pikas and made into little piles, just like a hay pile, like an old hay pile. And they're all over the place. All over the place, and it's on the edge of the Gobi Desert. It's so cool, but there are no pikas. Hardly any pikas. I saw eight, and I saw about eight hundred of these. You yeah. know, so there's something going on there. That's really unfortunate, but I mean, it's not too surprising. Look at that landscape. Where are the plants? I mean, where's that green? Pikas have to eat all year long. And what? Like, like that would be gone. 
in like a day, and then there's another day. I mean, it's not that it's green there. What's going on? So then I read this paper just, um, oh, maybe it's more than a year ago now, not more than two, uh, where they looked at um, what was going on with, with pikas on the Tibetan Plateau where they lived like prairie dogs, um, really cold in the wintertime, and some yaks out there. And uh, they studied them in a place where there were lots of yaks and not too many yaks to see what was going on. And they found that in this spot, Pikas were exploiting yak dung. They were actually eating the yak dung, I think. They were, they were looking at whether they were anyway. They thought they probably were eating it. And I thought, oh, come on. I mean, I've seen a, I don't know. Here's a yak. Yaks are amazing. This one was in the Himalayas. You know, I was in Nepal, and one of the first great yaks I saw. And then we use them. We exploit them all the time. Um, they do great up there carrying stuff. And we even use their poop. So all throughout the Himalayas, uh, people dry the yak dung very carefully and use it as firewood. It burns great, doesn't smell bad, it's, it's great, fantastic heat source. So we're using it. Maybe it's a fantastic heat source for pipes too, metabolic heat. So here, here is a study where they actually look at pica poop samples to see whether they're containing yak DNA. And every time one of them glows like this, it means, oh, yeah, we found the yak DNA. All of these samples have yak DNA in them. And so then they're like, well, okay, maybe pikas are out there eating the grass and it has yak poop on it. Anything that eats the grass is going to have yak poop on it. So um, the yaks are going to have yak poop in their stomachs too, right? But no, they don't. Some of them do. Mostly the yaks don't have yak poop in their stomachs. Pikas do. They study this a few different ways. They look at yak poo density in the environment and pikas with yak tummy. <laughs> so <laughs> that's whether or not you can find the tough the DNA, yak DNA in, in the pikas stomach. And uh, another way they did it is really kind of fascinating. They are looking at the microbiome in the yak and the microbiome in the Pica, and they see that in the summertime, there's not much relationship here. There's a big crowd of points. But in the wintertime, it tightens right on up, and the microbiome in the pica's gut is real similar to the microbiome in the yak's gut, which means pikas are eating yak poop, because that's how you get your microbiome in alignment with something else. Anybody heard of a poop pill? So we, we use them now, if we've been on heavy antibiotics or something like that and you need to rejuvenate your gut, you can use a pill that has some, somebody else's poop in it and colonize your microflora again. Maybe that's what pikas are doing. Very interesting stuff and we might be able to um, get some science foundation money for studying. So what I noticed actually while I was there, but didn't put two and two together until I read that paper, is that when I'm looking at this landscape, this pika has nothing to eat. But I noticed, gosh, there sure is a lot of poop out there. If we look closely, there's a whole lot more poop on this ground than there is vegetation. And a whole bunch of different animals out there pooping. And maybe, I guess, not just on the Tibetan Plateau, maybe they're actually making a meal of this, of this resource. Now, this is what our habitat looks like. <laughs> this is where, this is literally right out of Pika's hay pile. I mean, beautiful Pika's garden. But this pike is collecting marmot scat. Why does it need to do that? Look at all that greenery. So there's maybe something more than calories going on now. I think in poop pool is maybe a really good idea. So the thing is, if a rodent lives next to you with all its creepy crawlies on it, and marmots, oh my gosh, and you drop one on accident, they have lice and mites and fleas and all kinds of stuff all over them, and they hibernate for eight or nine months of the year. Well, what do those ectoparasites do? You need to get on the pikas. If you're going to share ectoparasites with some rodents, and we know, you know how many diseases rodents can carry, maybe you need your microbiome to be able to fight off the diseases that rodents carry. 
If you need your microbiome to be able to just fight off rodent diseases, maybe you need to be having the same microbiome that the rodent has. So that, that's our, our million dollar hypothesis. And this is your photo, I think. I might be. <laughs> Did pikas share <coughs> their, um, their habitat with um, carnivorous animals? Yeah. So and do they eat their poop? Um, so I've seen a whole lot of hay piles. I, I actually take data on what's in the hay pile almost every time I see one. And um, I've seen poop from horses, you know, from pikas that are by the side of the trail, sheep, goats, deer, elk, um, almost everything but the predators. Okay. So I don't so see the I see a lot of, poop. Yeah, I see a lot of um, um, Martin, pine martin scat now. I, when I was first studying them, I didn't see pine martins, but now they've really come back, which is awesome. Um, and, and they poop around and they use their poop as like a signpost, so it's easy to find. Bikers don't put it in their hay pile. So um, it's, it's maybe that, that would help you think, well, one of two things. Maybe it's because herbivore poop is, you know, more palatable and has yeah. herbs in it, right? It's, it's got the stuff that I normally eat in it, and whereas you know, carnivore poop doesn't. But the other thing is um, uh, if you were trying to get somebody's Gut fauna, you wouldn't want a predator's gut fauna. I mean, that's not, that's a little far afield. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know. Interesting. <clears throat> so, yeah. Um, going back to where the populations are declining. Yeah. So, was, is that more a factor of decreased pre precipitation or the temperature? Because you were saying they were, could be freezing to death, but could be. Right. Lower precipitation. Right. Well, well, what's happening is um, throughout a whole bunch of the Great Basin, those mountain ranges are losing their snow back um, with climate change. They've been having less and less snow, especially at their lower elevations than they used to. Right here, we are not actually increased. We're not having a decrease in snowpack. We measure it on our lot ridge, and it's it's pretty good still. Um, uh, so. We don't know for sure whether um, out there in the Great Basin they are literally freezing to death over the winter. Uh, we just know that they're exposed more to cold temperatures, which, because there's no, no snow in places where they used to be, those pikes are exposed more to cold temperatures. And that would mean that they need to have more calories in their hay pile to get through the winter. At, at the very least, that's, that's one of the things they need. To get more calories in your hay pile to make it through the winter, you gotta work harder in the summer to make the hay pile. That's gonna get you hotter. It's also hotter in the summer out there than it used to be. So I call it a one-two punch maybe. It's colder in the winter because there's less snow, and it's warmer in the summer, and one-two, you're out, I get it, because you can't get enough calories, you can't collect enough over the, over the summer to make it through the winter. What I notice in my demographic studies when I'm tagging you know, pikas is that they seem to be lost during the winter, not in the summer. So when I, I don't get to see mortality, but I get to have a general idea of when it happened. And my general idea is it's happening in the winter. winter. But I don't really think it means they're actually freezing to death. It just means it's a good one line of freezing to death. And then maybe they're not, if it's mounting sooner, maybe there's less vegetation for them to gather. Yeah, yeah. So, so when the snow melts off faster, um, the vegetation changes in several ways. Maybe we've been noticing chemical changes in the vegetation as well as you know this different things. You know, the grasses are starting to outcompete the forbs. Um, um, Niwot, more grasses. If they need more forbs to make it through the winter, which was what the argument was, the forbs are have more calories and they need those. Well, that's not going to help the bike is in the future if there's just more grass. Um, so that's another way that it can change. And another way is, is it can senesce earlier, right? Because it's a drier summer. Maybe it gets all dry and crispy. And maybe maybe that's not good for them. Maybe it needs to have a longer burning season. We don't know. Do you have any sense for how long they live? Yeah, so um, 
it's, it's a real skewed distribution. So most of the juveniles that are born don't make it to their first through their first year. Um, so in a really good pica population like this one in Montana, they have pretty nice demographic rate. About 30% of the juveniles would make it from when I see them uh, up at the top of the tail list to the next year. Um, but 60 or 70% of the adults would make it over that year period. And what, it, what that ends up being is uh, supposedly, in general, two to three years. I've had pikes live as long, tacked pikes live as long as nine years, but not recently. <laughs> it seems like, it seems to me like uh, survival annuals were going down. Well, making it past that first year. Yeah, that's a hard thing because, because like I said, they got a lot to do in that first couple of months, and otherwise the winter's going to be real hard on. The hay piles seem to be pretty exposed. They don't like take it under the talus, or do they take it under? Well, it's kind of kind of uh, both. So, so at the Montana study site, I can really see those hay piles, but they're always tucked under a rock to some extent, except for the funny Dr. Seuss pile I told you that's like out in the open. Um, most of them are tucked under a big rock, but you can still see them. It kind of looks like a big map, you know, you can see the lettuce sticking out around the edges, right? Um, but but on Niowa, it's real windy. It's not in a box canyon, it's kind of the other way around, so exposed to the wind. And they don't have them sticking out. You gotta look pretty closely and they do take it underneath the rocks as much as they can. So it's really environment dependent. Do they kind of burrow under the snow? They can make tunnels or do they just stay? They can make tunnels under the snow, yeah. And they can come out all winter and bask in the sun when they need to. And Bob Creer, when he was out there every week, he would see pica tracks in the snow going from a patch here through the trees to another patch over there. And you have to see them traveling around. And the best way to travel is on top of the snow. Burrowing through for many meters is really hard. So. Do they have multiple piles in the kids? Yeah, but they're all within a, a 10 meter radius. So there's no family group? Not for North, the North American pikas, no. Um, those ones out on the Tibetan plateau that are exploiting yak species, they live in family groups like prairie dogs. Um, natural lineal family groups, just like prairie dogs. Um, but here with the uh, tailless drilling pikas in, and in Asia, all tailless drilling pikas are individually territorial. It's only the step dwelling ones where they have to work together to make that tunnel system, work together to collect the hay that goes down in there, um, that the yaks can come and, you know, you actually come and wipe out your whole hay pile, you better have a family unit that's going to help you, let you eat theirs right. when yours is gone. Um, so there's all kinds of different pressures on the, on, the, on the plateau than there are in the rocks. Apparently in the rocks, it's not so hard to just defend your territory and screw everybody else, I got my own hay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, online question, do they have multiple litters a year like rabbits and how big are the litters? They can have multiple litters, but they are much less likely to than a rabbit. Um, very unusual for a female pike to have enough resources to, to pump out su successful litters. They usually have three um, offspring per, per litter. They can have a, they can have more, but I've never seen it. Um, and and just think what happens. So you you get pregnant. It takes about a little over three weeks of gestation, and then it takes a little over three weeks to wean and then you're going to get pregnant again and have another litter but that litter is going to be tiny by the end of the summer there's still going to be little itty bitty guys by the end of the summer what's their chance of surviving they're not going to be able to disperse and get a hit on time so there it's not just it's, it's not necessarily the greatest thing to be pumping out a bunch of litters when you're a pike and you're you really need that that first litter needs to get a good start what about predators? Yeah, so um, the main, the most important predators for pikas are the, in the weasel family. So all the weasels, the pine martins, um, the occasional wolverine. Um, then the silent avian predators, the owls, those are also pretty good at hit pikas. You find a lot of pika bones in, in owl pellets. Um, the, the other noisy avian predators don't have much of a chance. Um, I've you know, been around when hawks, even Cooper's hawk or anything, you stoop for a pika, but you can hear them coming and the pika just tumbles into a crack and, and birds again. 
dispersing pikas can be picked off by coyotes and foxes and stuff. But pikas in the tail of slow. They're so bold. They're like, they have, I, they have what I call the little dog syndrome. They, <laughs> they literally don't care about you or anything. And they're, they're not very vulnerable. They're not even very vulnerable to weasels, which is surprising because weasels, of course, are small enough to get in where the pikas are. But the pika knows that labyrinth perfectly. And once a weasel goes down in there under the rocks, the whole thing smells fresh pika. They don't know which way to go where the pika <laughs> went. So you can, it's not a tunnel where you get to follow. It's a labyrinth. And, it's, and, and so the pika can make a turn, and the chance that the weasel's still on its tail is 50%. It makes one more turn, and the chance is 25%. And pretty soon the weasel's totally lost under there. So I, I think that's what's going on. They're very bold. I've had pikas, tech pikas live for years next to marmot, I mean, next to uh, weasel dens and, and pike marmot dens. Um, so they're not particularly vulnerable once they are old enough. But they still hunt them like crazy. I mean, I mean, up and they, they do, but you, you, when you see a weasel coming through and hunting, it may or may not be hunting pikas. Good point. Voles are, voles are the thing they right. usually have in their mouth. Okay. <laughs> So, um, so this one, what, and so how do the pikas move? I was wondering, how do they move those rocks? They're huh. almost the size those, of the pike. I know, yeah. those that I didn't get to see because there weren't any pikes, unfortunately. But I have uh, the Mongolians that I met told me they just pick them up in their mouth. They literally pick them up in their mouth. I would love to see that. It would be so awesome. One more online oh, sorry. question. That's yeah. okay. Um, um, she wanted to know when are the babies born typically? Well, it, it, they can be born um, as early as April, but May is a pretty common time. Um, just before the snow comes off, they can be born. Um, and then they can continue to be born throughout the summer, like we talked about, but it isn't as, as common as early. If they're individually territorial, how do they decide? It's time to get together with the male somewhere and the female somewhere. Yeah, well, they're they're individually territorial, but I I call them colonial. So you think of a colony of seabirds, you know, they're they're also individually territorial. They're always just squabbling over who's next to the nest. Pikas are the same way. It's just on a bigger scale. So literally, you always have a neighbor. If it's a giant tail slope and there happen to be no pikas there, if one colonized it. Then the second one would come and live right next door. It wouldn't be like on the other side of the tail slope. So they, they always have mates available if if there are other pikas around. Um, but uh, because because they do help each other in terms of well that vigilance for predators and they have the calls. We did hear the call, and I know you guys are probably not always in the but I do have this thing. If you want, we can. Here, here's a male on. It goes on. It's called a song. We, I call it a break because to me it's not like a little donkey. <laughs> um, and in my experience, only males do it. Um, it says in the literature that sometimes females do. Um, you'd have to have this type of tag for them. In the background, we can hear a female doing a duet with him. So she's calling once in a while while he's doing his long song. And that, that's fair bond. That's the extent of it. You know, maybe he's snuggling and kissing. They just like, this guy will do his long call and she'll every once in a while interject. But I was like, yeah, you're, you, yeah, I'm your, yeah, yeah, you're my guy. But, but leave me alone. Just stay away. I've never once seen them mate. I've never seen them, you know, come here. Um, obviously, yeah. But, but it's not something I do want to do. Oh, this is really funny. One last thing. So here's Juvenile. And these little, these little males, they start early. <laughs> this is what I call the supplication. Calls. It means don't chase me away. Oh no, don't chase me. I want to live here. Oh, don't chase me. So they don't nurse. They, they do forage nurse. immediately. They only nurse for three weeks. And then, and then they're on their own. And then the parents start to, start to chase them away from, from 
from the the uh, nursery that I call it. Um, it's not the female hay pile. It's some place yeah. nearby. And usually, thank goodness you said that. It's a marmot den. So the female likes to have her offspring in the marmot den. I think that that helps protect them against predators because weasels can run off most of those. I mean, weasels. Marmots can run off most weasels. The adult marmot has no problem running off um, a weasel. Um, and they do because, of course, the weasels after they're young. So if the pike is there in a, in a marmot den, they have a much better chance of, of uh, raising their offspring. Do they come out during the day and the night, or only during the day? Pikes are known as diurnal, so they mostly in the daytime. But if you're camped next to a pika um, slope, you'll hear them call once in a while during the night. Now, I have my cameras out 24-7. Um, the peak activity is 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Um, yeah, so th those are the peaks. Um, they're not out at night most of the time, but catch them on the camera once in a while. Yeah, check it out sometimes. Thanks, you guys, so much. This was fascinating. Thank you so much. I've got about 10 more questions in my head that we don't have time for, but. Yeah. <laughs> You were excellent. Thank you for coming and making the trek. Sure. Looks like you're going to need new batteries. Okay. Our next talk. Our next talk is going to be February 23rd, and it's about moose. Oh, nice. That's another climate sensitive animal. Jared Krikowski is going to be the uh, speaker. He's the one who does guiding in the park. Good. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you guys.